When you think of the portrayal of idolatry in the Bible, you probably think about the worship of the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai. In Exodus, Aaron helped the Israelites melt down gold and shape it into a calf. This story symbolizes the dangers of idol worship. The ending, where Moses tells his loyal followers, an exclusive group of Levites, to execute their brothers, friends, and neighbors by the sword is an incredible warning to those who disobey the second commandment. The golden calf narrative from Exodus has a long history, not only in its construction, but also in its origin. Did Aaron really fashion a golden calf for the wandering Israelites? How was the story read in the ancient world? Did any of it actually happen? Could any of it have actually happened? Today, I hope to answer these questions and more as I search for the golden calf. In the ancient Near East, bull worship was widespread and permeated nearly every civilization. Before the writing of the golden calf narrative in Exodus, and even before King Jeroboam I erected his two golden calf statues, representing gods as bulls was commonplace. In ancient Canaan, for example, we find the epithets Bull El and El is Bull to refer to the chief god of ancient Canaan, El. Nowadays, El is often used as a generic term for god. Ugaritic texts also reveal that Baal, the son of El in some pantheons, although this changes depending on which pantheon, was also represented and referred to as a bull and was identifiable with bulls in iconography. This trend wasn't limited to Ugarit or even Canaan. Bull worship was as far as the eye could see. This included Apis in Egypt, Tesub among the Hurrians, and the storm god Adad of the Akkadians, who was referred to as a fierce young bull. In ancient Babylonia as well, we see signs of reverence for bulls in their architecture. Entering an Assyrian palace, one would see human-headed winged bulls that guarded the gates. Marduk, the chief god of Babylon since the time of Hammurabi, was also associated with bull imagery, being called Young Wild Bull of Day. At that time in the ancient Near East and surrounding areas, there existed the ancestor to modern bovines, the oryx. These were very similar to the bovine species of today, but they were much greater in size. They were large enough that cave paintings often depicted them as being much larger than the other animals drawn. To those in the ancient Near East, the bull represented strength. For this reason, aspects of the bull were often associated with powerful deities. This bull imagery and bull worship didn't exist in a vacuum, however, and the Israelites, either being descendants of Canaanites or migrating from the Negev, were not free from these influences. Despite the central conflict within the Golden Calf narrative and the firm stance of modern Abrahamic religions against idolatry, the bull was seen as a symbol of strength for the Israelites. In the Bible, Yahweh is often referred to as the Bull of Jacob, such as in Psalms 132.2, 5, Isaiah 49.26, Genesis 49.24, and more. It also seems very possible that in Numbers 23.22, and later repeated in Numbers 24.8, Yahweh is described as having the horns of a wild ox, as is argued by scholars like Thomas Romer and Marcus Smith, although it's unclear whether this is describing Israel or Yahweh. With bulls being almost universally seen as symbols of strength, it's no surprise that archaeology has revealed to us many examples of bull-related iconography in the ancient Near East. In the northern hills of Samaria in the land of Manasseh, archaeologists found a small bronze bull figurine which was dated to the early Iron Age. After excavating the rest of the site, called the Bull Site, the archaeologists realized this area was an open area for worship. It's likely that in early Israel, Yahweh was also associated with calves and was depicted as a bull. Evidence for this can be found in the polemical writings of Hosea, as well as in the Sumerian Ostrakhan 41, a potsherd, dating to around 800 BC. First, let us examine the writings of Hosea. In Hosea 8, 5-6, we are told about Hosea's feelings toward the Yahwistic cult in Israel. Samaria, throw out your calf idol, my anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from Israel. This calf, a metal worker, has made it. It is not God. It will be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. It seems clear that Hosea has problems with the bull imagery in use in Israel. To further the point, we are also told that now they sin more and more. They make idols for themselves from their silver, cleverly fashioned images, all of them the work of craftsmen. It is said of these people, they offer human sacrifices, they kiss calf idols. Hosea 13.2 
Furthermore, Hosea 10.5 states that the people who live in Samaria fear for the capital of beth -Avon. beth -Avon being a pun on Bethel. Bethel, the actual name of the city, means house of God, while beth -Avon means house of wickedness. Next we move on to a curious inscription on a piece of pottery found in Samaria in the time of the Northern Kingdom. In 1910, 102 pieces of ancient pottery, ostraca, were found. One of the personal names listed on Ostracon 41 is Egelio. Ancient names often contained divine names within them. This is called Theophory, and it was widespread throughout the ancient Near East, and even in surrounding areas. For example, Tutankhamun means living image of Amun, Israel means struggles with God, and Jeroboam means ball contends. Similarly, Egelio, the name found on the Astrakhan, means young bull is Yah. Yah is actually a shortened form of the Tetragrammaton, or Yahweh. From the evidence, we can tell that in the time before the Babylonian exile in 597 BCE, Israel was worshipping Yahweh as a bull. This is the same way in which the Canaanites worshipped Baal, as a bull. It's likely that in this early stage of Yahwism in Israel, the cult integrated traditions of Baalism. The bull would be a representation of both Yahweh and Baal within the greater context of Phoenicia. This would have been at a time when idolatry wasn't looked down upon, but was commonplace. The aniconism of a later stage in history had not yet arrived on such a massive scale. Even though Hosea described the bull worship in Samaria and was clearly against it, it's likely the bull iconography was also prevalent in Judah. We see this from the descriptions of Solomon's temple. In 1 Kings 7, after the building of the temple, the structure must be adorned with imagery, altars, and more. One of the altars, referred to as the sea, was basically a giant cauldron. It was placed on top of 12 bull statues. Later, we are told of some of the portable stands that were also engraved with images of bulls, cherubim, and lions. If this is an accurate description of the temple, it seems likely that this was just decorative. But just as the cherubim had a special place in the imagery surrounding Yahweh, so too did the bull. This doesn't mean that bulls were necessarily an object of worship in Judah, nor does it mean that bulls were a form of Yahweh in the southern Yahwist cult. From what I can tell, it looks like the bull was more like a companion animal, a signifier of Yahweh's presence, similar to Hera's peacock or Zeus's eagle. The widespread aniconism that we would see from the Israelites only came at a later date. During the reign of King Josiah, who was king from about 640 to 609 BCE, reforms were beginning to take place. According to the story given in 2 Kings, Josiah began renovating the temple. We are told that during these renovations, the high priest, Hilkiah, discovered the Book of the Law. From the actions Josiah took, it has been long noted that the scroll said to have been discovered by Hilkiah was Deuteronomy, or at least a part of it. The first thing he did was destroy the Asherah poles, the high places, and anything resembling worship of other gods. He desecrated the hill shrines of Samaria and even killed the priests. He effectively turned the nation monotheistic, which differed heavily from the henotheism of the previous years, meaning that before Josiah's reforms, the Israelites believed in many gods but only worshipped one, the supreme god, Yahweh. These reforms were cut short, however, when Pharaoh Necho killed Josiah in a battle at Megiddo and placed Judah under Egyptian control, setting into motion events that, within a few years, would lead to the Babylonian exile. We will discuss some specific aspects of these reforms later. After the exile, the Israelites were obviously distraught, and they figured that the only reason their almighty god Yahweh would allow them to be exiled was because they had done something wrong. They figured that it was their iconography and idol worship. This is the political background we have to keep in mind when covering these upcoming topics. With the background of bull worship that has just been presented, it seems an appropriate time to finally delve into the meat of this story. There are two golden calf narratives in the Bible, three if you want to count the brief retelling in Deuteronomy. The first, which nearly everyone is familiar with, is the narrative in Exodus 32, which includes Aaron and the Israelites at the base of Mount Sinai. We will cover more of it later, but the second, and probably earliest, is the story of King Jeroboam's calves in 1 Kings 12. In a strange attempt to save his own life and remain in control of Israel, Jeroboam set up two golden calves, one at Bethel and one at Dan. 
He figured that with the calves in place, the Israelites would remain in Israel under his rule and not leave to follow Rehoboam. The golden calves only reach their end during Josiah's reforms, when they are destroyed along with the other altars. Note that the narrative about Jeroboam's golden calves might actually be a later polemic and not actually resemble anything Jeroboam ever did. For the purposes of this video, I will assume that the story is at least partially accurate in that Jeroboam did erect two golden calves. I am doing this because it doesn't change the influence of the first king's story on the Exodus sequence. The Exodus calf narrative would have come out just the same, whether or not the events actually happened in Israel's history. Before diving into this further, let us recall the golden calf narrative in Exodus. While Moses is away at Mount Sinai, the people begin to plead with Moses' brother Aaron to fashion for them a golden calf. He takes from the Israelites their earrings and makes them a calf. He then builds an altar in front of the calf and proclaims a festival to the Lord. God, having knowledge of this, is furious and tells Moses that he will destroy them. Moses convinces God not to do this and the people are spared. Moses then comes down the mountain and stumbles upon this calf worship. Moses destroys the calf and says, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. The Levites, and only the Levites, gather around Moses in support of him. Then Moses commands a slaughter of those that did not support him. The Levites grab their swords and kill those that oppose Moses and the Lord. Immediately after seeing the two golden calf narratives, some parallels can be seen. There are the obvious ones, of course, but a closer look will show that these two stories and the characters in them are so similar that anybody would be hard-pressed to say that one was not based on the other. There are 13 parallels in total between Aaron and Jeroboam, but we will only be covering the ones that directly relate to the calf narratives. First, there's the obvious one of both Aaron and Jeroboam erecting golden calves. Next, nearly the same sentence is said after the construction of the calves. In 1 Kings 12, 28, after the calves are set up, Jeroboam says, Here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. This sentence, almost verbatim, is what is said by the Israelites when the calf is made. These are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt, in Exodus 32, 4. Furthermore, it's clear that the worship was meant to be Yahwistic in both stories, since the identifier of the god is the one who brought you up out of Egypt. After the altars are built, a festival is proclaimed, Exodus 32, 5, 1 Kings 12, 32. Sacrifices are then made on the altar, Exodus 32, 6, 1 Kings 12, 32. In 1 Kings 12, 31, Jeroboam specifically appoints priests who are not Levites. In Exodus 32, 26, the Levites are said to be the only ones to oppose the calf worship. This parallel can be extended by the slaughtering of the non-Levites that actually engaged in the calf worship. Moses commands the Levites to kill their brothers, the non-Levites, and Josiah slaughtered the priests of the high places of Samaria. Remember that these were specifically non-Levites as well. For both of these narratives, the calf worship is said to be the great sin, Exodus 32.21, 1 Kings 14.16. The punishments for both of these sins are not merely personal toward Aaron or Jeroboam. They prove to be the sin that results in a catastrophe for the people. Both of them are threatened with destruction, but eventually come to a natural end. Exodus 32.14, 1 Kings 13.34 In both accounts, an intercession is made for the sinners. Israel is helped by Moses, and Jeroboam is helped by the prophet from Judah. Exodus 32.11, 1 Kings 13.6 a more important parallel concerns the destruction of the calves, but we will return to explore that one later in this video. How do we explain all these parallels? The idea that this is a coincidence seems implausible. One must be based on the other. I argue that the Exodus narrative serves two purposes. The first is that it was written as a polemic against Jeroboam and idolatry. The second is that it was written in such a way as to justify Josiah's reforms. The relationship between the stories has been noted for a long time but the calf narrative in Exodus had been seen as a polemic against the northern kingdom. That seems unlikely though, because it was all of Israel, excluding the Levites, that committed this great sin, not just the northern tribes. It has also been proposed that Jeroboam was imitating Aaron and brought back to life the tradition of calf worship. Under this schema, however, Jeroboam would have access to the story in Exodus and the Ten Commandments, meaning an act of idolatry would be the worst possible move considering the consequences of these actions. Better explanations have been offered, and I will be arguing for those. 
But before delving a little further, let's discuss the parallel text in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, just before the entrance into the Promised Land, Moses is recounting the journeys he and his people have went through. In chapter 9, Moses begins discussing the construction of the calf. Modern translations often give a header for the section and label it as the golden calf. But the curious thing is that nowhere in the text does it say the calf is made of gold. Moses speaks of a time when he was on the mountain and the people built a calf. Moses exclaims that God wanted to destroy them, but he was able to convince God not to. He describes the destruction of the original tablets because of his anger and how God gave him a new set. Moses speaks of how he destroyed the calf and concludes with how he pleaded for the people. There is a lot to unpack in these three narratives. How do we construct a historical model to explain what we have? I think it's most likely that the author of the narrative in Exodus used the story of Jeroboam's golden calves as a template while also taking pieces from the account in Deuteronomy. The influence of the Jeroboam story can clearly be seen in three of the parallels present. The fact that nearly the same exact phrase is used by Jeroboam and the Israelites, the description of the calf or calves as being gold, and the fact that sacrifices are offered and a festival is declared all point to being linked to the first king's narrative because none of these appear in the retelling in Deuteronomy 9. This doesn't mean that the narrative in Deuteronomy had no influence on the text of Exodus, however. Exodus 32.20 shows the influence of Deuteronomy 9.21, both of which give us a description of the destruction of the golden calf. In Exodus, we are told that Moses took the calf the people had made and burned it in the fire. Then he ground it to powder scattered it on the water, and made the Israelites drink it. In Deuteronomy, we can see the exact same verbal parallels. Also, I took that sinful thing of yours, the calf you had made, and burned it in the fire. Then I crushed it and ground it to a powder as fine as dust, and threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. Both of these accounts speak of the calves being burnt, ground into a powder, and the dust being scattered. In the parallel account in 2 Kings, the calves are burnt and ground into a dust. Keep in mind that burning gold is impossible and grinding something that is already burnt makes no sense. But we'll get to that. Here's where we can discuss the influence of the surrounding religions on the destruction of the golden calf. While all these accounts show direct verbal parallels, the narrative of Josiah's destruction of the Asherah pole in 2 Kings 23.6 is even more directly related. He burns it, grinds it to dust, and scatters the remains on some graves. Where does this motif of burning, grinding, and scattering come from? An answer to this can be found in the Ugaritic texts in the narrative of Anat's destruction of Mat, the god of death in the underworld. There are two versions of this Ugaritic text that are preserved, and we will read both of them. The first one is from a story in which Anat is avenging the death of her brother Baal. She seizes divine Mat. With a sword she splits him, with a sieve she winnows him. With a fire she burns him, with millstones she grinds him, in a field she sows him. Birds eat his flesh, fowl devour his parts, flesh to flesh cries out. Mott eventually comes back to life and confronts Baal about all the suffering he had to endure. He says to Baal, Because of you I have suffered burning, because of you I have suffered grinding by millstones, because of you I have suffered scattering in the sea. The text is broken, so I have omitted the lines we can't decipher. The phrasing of burning, grinding, and scattering seems to be an ancient Near Eastern motif of total annihilation. Further influence on Exodus from Deuteronomy can be noted by the dual speeches of Yahweh in Exodus 32, 7-10 and Deuteronomy 9, 12-14. The text is so similar that there must be direct literary dependency. The traditional view would be that obviously it was Moses who received the speech in the first place, so of course he would be able to recite it. The problem is that we have already shown that the Exodus narrative was written post-exile, when the Deuteronomistic history, Joshua, Judges, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and 1st and 2nd Kings, was nearly in its modern form. From the language used in Deuteronomy and much of the Deuteronomistic history, we can see that they were written by the same people, placing their writing at the same points in time. The author of the Golden Calf narrative in Exodus would need to have been writing afterwards. Let's first take a look at the speeches in Deuteronomy. Then the Lord told me, Go down from here at once, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have turned away quickly from what I have commanded them, 
and have made an idol for themselves. And the Lord said to me, I have seen this people, and they are a stiff-necked people indeed. Let me alone, so that I may destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make you into a nation stronger and more numerous than they. Deuteronomy 9.12-14 to The first speech is directly related to the calf. The second speech is more general, being about the people and their doom. A doom that of course wouldn't come because of Moses' intercession, but it's still explicitly about the fate of the people. The speech is clearly Deuteronomistic as it fits into the larger context of the chapter and matches the language of the surrounding narrative. Verses 9, 1-7 in particular share many of the same ideas with this speech. The people are described as stiff-necked, 9-6. There is a reference to nations greater and stronger than you, 9-1, a reference to the destruction of wicked nations, 9, 4 to 5. And outside of these verses, in Deuteronomy 7, there is a reference to the destruction of their name from under heaven, 7, 24. It seems clear to me that the author of the Exodus narrative took from both Deuteronomy and 1 Kings to construct his narrative. He also borrowed the destruction motif from 2 Kings. Taking from two different sources, but in all likelihood two parts of the same source, the author of the Exodus Golden Calf story was able to integrate two themes and fulfill two purposes in his writing. The first, which we have already covered, is the denigration of Jeroboam's golden calves and being a polemic against idolatry. The second is more nuanced and hinges on the background of Josiah's reforms discussed earlier. The Exodus Calf narrative served the purpose of justifying the new reforms. With destruction being common for the people of Israel, they reasoned that their bad actions of idolatry were the cause for their displeasure. This is why Josiah's reforms had to have anti-idol tendencies. The composition of the Deuteronomistic history is long and complicated. It's only important to know that by the time of the writing of the Exodus narrative, the Deuteronomistic history was in near-complete form which would have been post-exile. Whether or not Josiah's reforms happened the way they were described doesn't matter. The story of the golden calf was written to justify these new ideas that Israelites believed would save them from future harm. We will only be looking at a few of these elements to demonstrate the point. Aaron is, of course, meant to represent the priest at a high place. High places were generally local and small sanctuaries for worship and sacrifice. They were everywhere. Priests at high places would build altars, make the idols, and lead the people in worship. Throughout the Bible, Aaron is always seen as being the father of the priesthood, always doing something a priest would do. In the Golden Calf narrative, he acts like a priest, but in a way which attacks these cultic sites. This would support the theme of centralization that is so crucial to Josiah's reforms. To add more fuel to the fire, the author of the Exodus narrative decided to use the Levites to symbolize this centralization. They serve a special role throughout the book and as such needed to be consecrated to perform priestly duties. The idea of the Levites as not being a tribe in the same sense as the other tribes is not a new one. They are represented as sort of a brotherhood, which can be seen in the fact that they received no allotment of territory. Their role was to serve the priestly functions at the temples. As has been noted by a variety of scholars, the narrative of the breaking of the tablets of the law and their subsequent rewriting is meant to represent the new set of rules the kingdom is to abide by. It's also been noted by scholars like Michael Coogan that the commandments are written in a way a ruling state would make contracts with their vassals. The new set of laws was just that, a new set of laws. Finally, to turn back to the scattering of the dust on the water, we are told in Deuteronomy 9.21 that Moses threw the dust into a stream that flowed down the mountain. What stream was this meant to be? In the Exodus account, the stream would just be the water that was flowing from the rock after Moses struck it in Exodus 17. In light of the close relationship between Deuteronomy and 2 Kings, we can conclude that the ancient audience would have understood this as an allusion to the Kidron River, where Josiah threw many of the remains of the cult objects he had destroyed in 2 Kings 23. This further strengthens the Golden Calf narrative as a way to justify Josiah's reforms. To summarize, bull worship was an incredibly common practice in the ancient Near East. The evidence suggests that Yahweh was represented as a bull and even worshipped in bull form in ancient Israel. The stance of idol worship being a sin would only come at a later date after the Babylonian exile, when the Israelites figured idol worship to be the great sin that led to their downfall. Jeroboam may or may not have actually erected two golden calves. It's perfectly possible that he did. Either way, the Deuteronomistic history presents this as a great mistake 
and when writing the Golden Calf narrative in Exodus, the author is creating a polemic against Jeroboam and idol worship, all while working to justify the reforms of Josiah. All the texts we covered have a long and complex compositional history. For a more in-depth discussion on that, I recommend The Life of Moses by John Van Setters for a full breakdown of what was added to which text, when, and why. Thanks for watching. If you haven't yet, be sure to like and subscribe. If you enjoy our content and want to help support this channel, check out our Patreon and Teespring links in the description. If you don't want to spend money but still see what we're doing outside of YouTube, make sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Also, make sure to check out our website, milwaukeeatheists.com. We'll see you next time.